Psychological Commentaries on the Teaching of Gurdjieff and Aspensky by Maurice Nicole Book 1 The Idea of Transformation in the Work Birdlip, July 27, 1941 Part 3 In order to continue these talks about transformation, let me take a question of this kind. What prevents impressions from transforming themselves in us? Why does this not always happen? Let us again study this subject. Impressions should pass on in their octave until they reach me 12. You will remember that they come in as 48, but do not continue to evolve. Remember also that the first conscious shock is to make impressions pass on in their evolution, namely to hydrogen 24 and then to hydrogen 12. That is, by means of the first conscious shock, Do 48 becomes Re 24 and then Mi 12. Now two things must be borne in mind and clearly understood. 1. The first conscious shock does not happen to man asleep. It is a conscious effort requiring special knowledge and self-observation and given in connection with the incoming impressions of life and a person's mechanical reactions to them. Roughly, it consists in seeing the object and seeing one's reaction to it simultaneously, and without being identified. This process is sometimes put diagrammatically as follows. 2. The first conscious shock to the human machine increases the energies of the machine in the form of hydrogen-24 and hydrogen-12. The result is actually to give every cell in the body different food, that is, higher hydrogens. In regard to this second point, let me remind you here that neither the psychical nor the physical functions of man can be understood unless it is grasped that they can both work in different states of consciousness. If the first conscious shock is applied, the third state of consciousness is touched, with the result that the human machine works in a different way, owing to new energies, both as regards its psychical and its physical functions. The third state of consciousness is the state of self-remembering, which man should possess but which he has gradually lost because of the wrong conditions of his life. Today it can be said only to occur in the form of very rare flashes. It is the creation of this third state of consciousness that forms the first conscious shock. That is, the first object of the work is to recover this lost state, namely, to make a man remember himself, until eventually he does not merely have rare flashes of increased consciousness, over which he has no control, but can create in himself increasing degrees of self-remembering by deliberate efforts. These efforts, which belong to the first conscious shock, gradually cause the machine to work more rightly, Many wrong functions, both in the psychic and physical spheres, acquired by the wrong working of the machine in the two lowest states of consciousness, that is, in darkness, then begin to disappear of themselves. Now let us return to the question as to what prevents Do 48 from passing on to Ray 24, and then to Me 12. Why does not this always happen? It does happen in childhood and to a certain extent Me-12 is created in the body in early youth. We may remember its action, but as personality grows more and more thickly round essence, it happens less and less. That is, impressions are more and more intercepted by personality, which is represented in the diagram by the double line marked X. Impressions coming in through the senses fall, as it were, on a thick net which catches everything, save a very small part which passes onwards and produces a very small amount of Me-12. This net is the personality, with its strong buffers, its fixed attitudes, its mechanical associations, its roles automatically set in motion, and its ideas that it knows and can do. With all its contradictory eyes, with all the different forms of negative emotion, which it has acquired by imitation, with all its habits of identifying, considering, self-justifying, imagining, and lying, centered in the false personality. 
All these prevent impressions from passing on in their normal transformations. In other words, something opaque, as it were, has formed itself at the place where impressions enter, and closed up the way for their passage onwards. Now from the standpoint of triads, impressions entering as hydrogen 48 cannot pass to hydrogen 24 unless hydrogen 12 is present. Hydrogen 12 must be brought up to the place where impressions are entering. Personality is constructed mainly out of hydrogen 48, the formatory hydrogen. So you have impressions 48 falling on personality 48. And since the necessary elements of a triad are therefore lacking, no transformation is possible. In the case of food, ordinary food, that is hydrogen 768, on being taken in, it meets with the gastric juices and their active ferments belonging to the order of hydrogens 192, and the result is the transformation of 768 into 384. But in the case of impressions once personality is formed, no corresponding active ferment meets them, in this case hydrogen 12. The work itself must be brought up to the place to act as a ferment, for the work is to make a man think in a new way, and to awaken him. What does this mean? How can a man bring the work up to the place of incoming impressions? In brief, by remembering the work emotionally. The more a man through right self-observation feels his own helplessness, the more he realizes his ignorance, the more he sees his mechanicalness and that he is a machine, the more he perceives his own utter nothingness, the more emotional will the work become to him. The work can exist in us as hydrogen 48, then it is merely in personality, as something formatory in the memory. It can exist in us also in terms of hydrogen 24, then it is emotional. It can also become so valuable, so important to us, that it begins to have the intensity of meaning and significance that belong to hydrogen 12. In that case, false personality will begin to collapse, and a man will become as a little child. This is one meaning of the saying, except ye become as little children. If a man's love no longer runs always into himself, into his habitual ideas of himself, his strange vanity and esteem of himself, that is, into false personality, then the direction of his will alters, that is, the resultant of his desire alters. When the valuation of the truth of esoteric teaching becomes stronger than self-valuation, it begins to act on a man. He begins to take everything differently. The whole way in which he reacts to outer life changes. Why cannot you all understand that life is impressions? He no longer reacts to impressions from his mechanical personality by always saying the same things, feeling the same things, and so on. He begins to act from the work, that is, in quite a new way. The work comes up to the place where life is entering him as impressions, and stands beside him. He begins to see life through the work, and instead of wasting his time in hundreds of forms of useless internal considering or negative reactions, or of identifying, he seeks for the power of the work to help him to change these mechanical reactions which he is now aware of by observation, and to transform his habitual ways of taking things. He begins to live more consciously at this point where life is entering as impressions. The Idea of Transformation in the Work Part 4 Birdlip, September 12, 1941 Section 1 Let us take the idea of work on oneself. As you all know by now, we take the thing which we call oneself, that is, myself, yourself, as one thing. We think we are ourselves. Work on oneself is thus made quite impossible. 
How can you work on you if you and you in each case are one and the same thing? But you and yourself are not the same thing. If you and yourself were the same thing, work on yourself would be impossible. Think for a moment. If you and yourself are identical, that is, one and the same thing, how can you observe yourself? Would it not be impossible? A thing cannot observe itself. How could it do so? So if you take you as yourself and yourself as you and think that you and yourself are the same thing, then how do you propose to begin to observe yourself? You will try to observe you. And how can that be possible? A thing cannot observe itself. A thing identical with itself cannot see itself, because it is the same as itself. And a thing which is the same as itself cannot possibly have a standpoint apart from itself, from which to observe itself. I say all this in order to emphasize how difficult it is for people to begin to work on themselves. The reason is that they take themselves as themselves. If a man takes himself as himself, he cannot observe himself. Everything is himself. He says I to everything. And if a man says I to everything in himself, then everything in himself is I. And how can he observe himself? How can I observe I if they are one and the same thing? At one moment he is irritable and rude, at the next kind and polite. But he says I to it all. And so he cannot see it all. It is all one to him. He cannot see it apart from himself, and he and himself are one and the same thing to his mind, that is, to his way of thinking. This massive stumbling block lies across everyone's path, and long, very long overcoming of it is the task of work on oneself. And how long it takes before a man can begin to see what it all means and what the work is always saying. I have watched people in the work often for many years who have not yet caught a single flash of the meaning of self-observation. That is, people who still take everything that takes place in them as I, and say I to every mood, every thought, every impulse, every feeling, every sensation, every criticism, every feeling of anger, every negative state, every objection, every dislike, every hate, every dejection, every depression, every whim, every excitement, every doubt, every fear. To every train of inner talking, they say I. To every negative monologue, they say I. To every suspicion, they say I. To every hurt feeling, they say I. To every form of imagination, they say I. To every movement they make, they say I. To everything that takes place within them, they say I. In such a case, the work can only be something listened to externally, something they hear said to them, the words of which they remember or not, as the case may be. But they have no idea of what work on themselves means because they have no idea as yet that there is such a thing as themselves. They look out of their two eyes and they listen with their two ears and see and hear what is outside them. Where in this case is this thing called themselves? Is not everything outside them, save something they call I? Is not life a lot of things outside and something they take for granted as I, that is themselves? And if this work is not about the things outside, that they can hear and see and touch, what is it about really? For there is surely nothing else save outside things and something that is I. At the same time, they may feel the work emotionally. They may feel that it is about something strange and genuine and real. But they cannot see exactly what it is about. They continue to talk as they have always talked and say I to it all. They continue to feel and to think as they have always felt and thought, and they say I to it all. To all their manifestations, to all their mechanicalness, to all their inner life, they say I. And since everything is I, what is there to work on? 
this is quite true for if everything connected with a person in outer manifestations and in inner life is i and if there is only i if everything connected with him is i then there is nothing to work on for who can work on i if everything is i what can observe i if everything is i the answer of course is that nothing can a thing cannot observe itself there must be something different in it for the thing to observe itself and in our own cases in the case of everyone if there is nothing in us different from ourselves how can we observe ourselves and work on ourselves for to work on oneself it is necessary to begin to observe oneself but if i and myself are one and the same how can this ever be possible i will have nothing to work on for the reason that i regard everything i do everything i say everything i feel everything i think as i so that if you speak to me of myself i will take it that you are speaking of me of what i call i and whatever you say about me i will take it as myself that is as i for to my way of thinking i and myself are identical to my way of thinking they are one and the same thing section 2 last time a paper was read about the necessity of not taking everything as i and oneself you have heard it said before that unless a man divides himself in two he cannot shift from where he is this saying often used in the work refers to the beginning of the process of what is called inner separation a man must first divide himself into two but the further stages of inner separation are more complex than this let me give you an example it was recently said to me by someone that he had begun to see what self-observation and separation meant for the first time he said i have always been taking negative emotions as a nasty bit of myself i realize my mistake self-observation will show us our negative states but something further is as a rule necessary than mere observation of them and that is inner separation and no one can separate himself from anything he observes in himself if he regards what he observes as being himself for then inevitably the feeling of i will pass into what he observes in himself and this feeling of i will increase the strength and power of what he observes he has to learn to say in the right way this is not me not i now if he takes his negative emotions as a nasty bit of himself he will not be able to separate himself from them do you see why he will not be able to separate himself from them because he is taking them as himself and so giving them the validity of i and as was said in the last talk if we give to everything in ourselves the feeling of i if we say i to everything we think or feel or say or imagine nothing can alter for i cannot alter i and if we practice self-observation on this basis everything we observe will be i whereas the case really is that everything in us practically speaking is it that is a machine going by itself instead of saying i think we should realize it would be far nearer the truth if we said it thinks and instead of saying i feel it would be nearer the mark to say it feels what we call ourselves what we say i to is actually an immense world larger and more varied than the outer world we behold through our external senses we do not say i to what we see in the outer world but we say i to everything that takes place in our inner world this mistake takes many years even to modify a little but sometimes we are given the clear light of understanding for a moment and we realize what it means and what the work is continually telling us if a man ascribes evil to himself he is in the wrong position in regard to it just as if he ascribes good to himself and the merit of it every kind of thought can enter your mind every kind of feeling can enter your heart but if you ascribe them to yourself 
and say I to all of them, you fasten them to you and cannot separate internally from them. One can avoid negative thoughts and feelings if one does not take them as oneself, as I. But if one takes them as I, one combines with them. That is, one identifies oneself with them, and then one cannot avoid them. There are inner states, states within us all, that we must avoid just as one avoids walking into mud in the external visible world. One must not listen to them, must not go with them, must not touch them or let them touch you. This is inner separation. But you cannot practice inner separation if you ascribe everything that takes place in your inner invisible life, where you really all live, to yourselves. I have often been struck by people asking me about themselves in regard to thoughts that plague and worry them. For example, people who pride themselves on being what is called clean-minded often find themselves tortured by indecent thoughts and images. This is exactly what happens if a person insists on thinking that everything in him or her is I. In this connection, I remember that after we left the Institute in France, we went to Scotland to my grandfather's house. He had collected an immense library, among which were a great many theological and moral volumes. They were, of course, entirely formatory. But having nothing else to read, I spent some of the long winter evenings there in trying to understand what they were about, there were the usual endless acrimonious arguments about the nature of the Trinity, the nature of heresy, and so on. But I noticed that one subject of debate that often came up was whether we are responsible for our thoughts. Some of the most severe moralists insisted that we were. But a few of these now long-dead theologians took the point of view that we were not. Some said that the devil sent us our thoughts. But no one of those writers whom I read took a psychological view of this question. At any moment, the strangest thoughts and images can enter us. If we say I to them, if we think that we thought them, they have power over us. And if we then try to eliminate them, we find it impossible. Why? I will repeat one of my own illustrations of this situation. Suppose you are standing on a plank and trying to lift it, and struggling as hard as you can to do so. Will you succeed? No, because you yourself are trying to lift yourself, and this is impossible. It requires a considerable reorientation of one's whole conception of oneself to be able to realize what all this means. So many buffers and forms of pride and stupid ways of thinking prevent us from seeing what the situation within us is really like. We imagine we are in control of ourselves. We imagine we are conscious and always know what we are thinking and saying and doing. We imagine we are a unity, and that we have a real permanent I, and so have will. And we imagine many other things besides. All this stands in our way, and before we can practice inner separation, a quite new feeling about oneself and about what one really is, is necessary. <laughs>